Hello, good morning, and thank you all for joining us today for this AGSIW webinar, Inherit Uncertainty, the Future of the U.S. Presence as Iraq Confronts Multiple Crises. My name is Raymond Karam, and I'm the Chief Program and Development Officer here at AGSIW. Uh, this session today is part of a series of programs we are hosting in a virtual format due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, we have a great lineup for you today, starting in Abu Dhabi with our good friend Mina Arabi, the Editor-in-Chief of The National. Linda Robinson, Senior International and Defense Researcher at the RAND Corporation. And last but not least, AJSIW President Douglas Silliman, who, uh, as you all know, served as U.S. Ambassador to Iraq from 2016 to 2019 and U.S. Ambassador to Kuwait from 2014 to 2016. The webinar will be moderated by our colleague Hussein Ibish, Senior Resident Scholar at AJSIW. The full bios of our speakers are available on our website, so you'll feel free, feel free to check them out uh, during the conversation. I'm also happy to say that we have more than 250 registered attendees this morning tuning in from all around the world. A disclaimer before we start, the webinar today is being recorded and will be made available on our website tomorrow. Also a reminder to our audience, you are in listen-only mode, but you will be able to ask your questions through the Q&A function in Zoom. And you can also email us at info at agsiw.org or tag us on Twitter at Gulf States. And with that, Hussein, over to you. Thank you very much, Raymond. Uh, so welcome to our webinar. And you can ask questions via uh, the chat function, by uh, Twitter, or via email. And I will do my best to present as many of them as possible to our guests before we have to wrap up. We're nominally slated to go to, for an hour till 1030, but uh, we might go over a little bit if, if your uh, questions are voluminous and interesting enough, which I suspect they may be. So the, uh, the focus of our conversation today is, is basically U.S.-Iraqi relations and how they're being affected by the uh, it's, it's whole series of events, right, that, that have recontextualized this struggle, which re in, in a certain sense, it remains very similar to the confrontation that we had a few months ago, um, except the context has evolved in some interesting ways. All, all three countries are struggle, struggling with the uh, coronavirus pandemic. Iran and the United States are two of the most affected countries in the world right now. And Iraq is one of these developing states with, uh, which is potentially very vulnerable to a major epidemic. Um, so it, it, it's all three countries are warily looking at the coronavirus. At the same time, as I say, the, the US and uh, Iran came close to some kind of all out confrontation, if not war, in Iraq in January, I mean, leading up to early January, on January 3rd, a U.S. drone strike uh, in Iraq killed Iranian General uh, Qasem Soleimani, the head of the IRGC Quds Force, and Iraqi militia leader uh, Abdel Mahdi al muhandis who was not just the head of Kata'ib Hezbollah, but nominally the head of the entire uh, PMF coalition. And we've seen a return to that tit for tat um, exchange of attacks um, on at least uh, the opening of a potential return on March 11, a, an attack on Camp Taji, which, which has been largely attributed to Kata'ib Hezbollah or offshoot groups, uh, killed two U.S. and one British serviceman. And the next day, the U.S. retaliated with attacks on at least five of the group's weapons depots. Uh, the, the reasons are not mysterious, right? Iran is still focused on finding relief from U.S. sanctions and believes that it needs military leverage to, to help do that. And the PMF uh, militia in Iraq and the battlefield in Iraq with plausible deniability uh, provides that. They need to secure the new leadership uh, of the PMFs, uh, give it a unified mission and focus uh, the PMFs together to assert their own control as well as the control of their uh, new um, proxy leader, uh, Abu Fadak. So uh, all of that is very important to Iran and that motivates them. A faction within the Trump administration reportedly led by Secretary of State Mike Pompeo and National Security Advisor Richard O'Brien is arguing that with Iran reeling from the economic crisis, the plunge in demand for and the price of oil, political crises in Iraq and Lebanon, new pressures um, to sort of elbow 
Iran Assad in Syria and the coronavirus epidemic. Now is the time to intensify pressure on the regime in Tehran. But at the same time, significant figures in both countries appear hesitant to risk all-out war, resulting in another carefully calibrated dance of death, just like we saw before. But of course, um, these things are very difficult to contain once they take on a life of their own. Meanwhile, Iraq may finally have found a new prime minister after four months without one. On April 9th, Iraqi President Barham Saleh has nominated Mustafa Al-Kadhimi, the Director of National Intelligence Services, and a former journalist as the latest prime minister designate, which gave him 30 days from then to assemble a cabinet and get a vote of confidence in parliament. And at this stage, he seems to be broadly acceptable to both the UN, US and Iran, although not so much to Tehran-backed militias, but, but still how far they'll go remains to be seen. It, it seems possible he may be, um, he may actually become the, the prime minister, but our guests will tell us about that. So with the help of our panel today, what we're going to look at is the future of uh, the U.S. military and even diplomatic presence in Iraq. Uh, will Washington and Baghdad agree, find an, an arrangement for the status of forces and other cooperative relations? Or will the U.S. troops uh, be ordered to leave um, by either Baghdad or Washington or both? Uh, how does all of this relate to internal power dynamics within Iraq and Iranian influence in Iraq? Uh, are the PMFs developing into a Hezbollah-like state within a state in Iraq? Or is the government poised to get more control over these militias? And of course, because we are a Gulf state-centered um, think tank, uh, how can Iraq's Gulf Arab neighbors help it develop a consolidated um, national government free of independent sectarian militias and uh, Iranian hegemony? I think this is the key. So I'd like to begin by asking Mina, uh, who is the, uh, a very distinguished Iraqi journalist and the editor-in-chief of The National, which, full disclosure, I'm a columnist for uh, at the weekend, um, to, to describe to us how Iraqi politics have been developing in recent weeks and the impact that the internal dynamics within Iraq, and especially regarding the, the political factions in Iraq, affect this set of issues. And I'll simply leave it at that and ask you to um, give us an overview, Mina. Thank you very much, Hussein. Um, and thank you for the Arab Gulf States Institute for getting us organized. Um, as ever, an interesting time in Iraq. As you rightly said, Mustafa Al-Kadhimi was named by President Farham Sadah to be Prime Minister designate on the 9th of April. Of course, uh, an ominous date for Iraq, as of course, 9th of April 2003 was when Saddam's regime fell and many uh, hopes and opportunities were missed. And in the last 17 years, we've kind of lurched from one crisis to another. Often, uh, many of them were not inevitable and could have been avoided. So the question is, with Kadami probably becoming prime minister because he does have large political backing, uh, and the opening of a new chapter for Iraq, can we move from this crisis mode to something that's a bit more functional? And the answer is yes and no. Yes, in the sense that, as ever, Iraqi political parties take Iraq to the brink and we're just about to fall off the cliff and then they pull back. And I think that's what's happened now with people rallying around Kadhimi, even though they may have preferred candidates, but they realize this is the one person perhaps they can coalesce around. And no, because no one person can fix the problems inside of Iraq, especially because so many of them are institutional. Right. And of course, for the last uh, 15 years, Iraq has had a constitution that's inherently weak and has many contradictions within it. Unless you have a strong constitutional foundation to build for the country um, on every front, whether it's legislative, whether it's uh, judicial, you're going to stay in these problems, um, problem areas. And so I'll just speak very briefly about Kadami's nomination, but also kind of the challenges that he's facing. And, and as you rightly said, Hassan, the internal political dynamic in Iraq is very interesting. So Kadami, uh, as people know, was the head of the intelligence service. He held that position for about four, uh, four years. It was very surprising to see him take that role at the intelligence service. And it is equally surprising for many people that he would emerge as the prime ministerial candidate. 
He is not known to be affiliated with a particular uh, political party, which is actually a positive thing, so he doesn't come with that baggage. But he was, many years ago, quite close to Ahmed al-Chalabi, uh, mm -hmm. quite close to Kanan Makiya, and for many Iraqis inside of Iraq, that has certain connotations. Um, and so he's tried to work away from that. As a journalist, he's written a, a lot about human rights, uh, civilian rights, and so forth. But for many people, that remains in their mind. So he'll have to work to change that image and to show himself as being a nationalist, somebody who understands the plight of Iraqis living inside Iraq, but also those who have suffered um, as a consequence of the last um, few year, decades in Iraq. Of course, his role as the intelligence chief gave him incredible relations um, with people throughout the region, but also abroad. He's one of those frequent attendees of the Munich Security Conference, um, where he would meet with everybody from uh, Petraeus and Leon Panetta to um, the officials from around European capitals and also regional, uh, uh, regional leaders. He also played a very important role in the last year and a half or so of the fight against ISIS and Daesh and the intelligence sharing that started with the Gulf countries um, to help secure the borders of Iraq. And I believe that that will actually help him, to your point I said earlier about the relationship with the Gulf, that those relationships and that trust that he was able to build will serve him well if he is able to get his cabinet passed. Uh, likewise, he has good relations with the Iranians um, anyone who wants to play a role inside of Iraq has to build those ties with Tehran. Um, yeah. Unfortunately, sometimes people seem to think, oh, you know, if he's got ties with Tehran, then he must be good or bad or whatever it is. But nobody can function in Iraq at a Syrian level without that relationship. Um, of course, the reason Mustafa Kalmi is becoming prime minister is because of the protest movement that happened in October and that led to the resignation of Adlab Mahdi. And so much has happened just in 2020. It's hard to think back what happened in 2019. And of course, the October protests now have been paused simply because of the coronavirus um, epidemic and, and the, the uh, many of the protest leaders called for their followers, um, but also just for regular young Iraqis have decided to stay home because of the pandemic. But there is that protest movement. It's alive and well and kicking. And Mustafa Kalbin will have to take into account that. Um, political fragmentation in Iraq is another um, element that will come into play that it also helped Kazemi become prime minister designate, but also could end up hindering him because there's that fragmentation, whether it's on the Kurdish front, whether it's on the Shia Iranian back front or on the Sunni front, there's huge fragmentation. In some ways, you can take that as an opportunity to build new coalitions, but on the others, it might make certain decision making more difficult. Um, and of course, for the Kurds, you know, it also it seems like ancient history, but they're still repairing their relationship with the Americans after their call for independence in that referendum, really rupturing yeah. ties with the U.S. So, so the Kurds now have come out and publicly supported Kalami, and and they will be working to show that they are again reliable partners for the U.S. And, and able to be kingmakers once again in Iraq after after being weak. Um, of course, some of the other challenges that uh, Kalami faces, in addition to the uh, political front and the uh, protest movement and the coronavirus, is the country's economic woes. Iraq has suffered from major economic woes because of corruption and mismanagement, and now we have the complete freefall of oil prices that will likely continue um, as oil prices drop. And so he comes, if he's able to form a government, which we think he will, he comes at a time when the coffers are basically empty. And so to, to, to maintain any semblance of um, state control, he's going to have to spend some money, but we're not really sure where that money will come from. So that's something that he faces. Um, I'm going to make two final points and then I'll hand over. One is about these um, Iranian-backed groups inside of Iraq. Part of the reason that Kalvami was able to get the support of Hadi al-Amari and others who are clearly against Kalvami publicly only recently, but coalesced around him is because Iraqi Shia political leaders do not want to be in a position where Hezbollah calls the shots inside of Iraq. And after the killing of Abdul Mahdi Mohandes, after the death of Soleimani, there is a sense that who's going to call the shots inside of Iraq and who becomes Tehran's main person. They don't want to see Qatar Hezbollah, they don't want Hezbollah to call that. So, so they will try to consolidate their position, whether it's, again, Hadi al-Amri, Al-Aziz Hakim or others. 
Um, and of course, this comes at a time that Iran is under pressure internally, again, because of coronavirus, um, economic woes, but also domestically facing their own uh, protest movement and after the, the tragic downing of the Ukrainian jetliner. And finally, the U.S. Um, I know Linda and um, Ambassador Silman will, will speak about this, so I don't want to go into it. Of course, we're all looking towards the June date of the strategic dialogue that's going to happen between the two countries. Uh, there is a question that many people ask inside of Iraq about this whole thing about wanting tr troop withdrawal. Many of the political parties that are not beholden to Tehran do not want to see the Americans withdraw because they feel that that really tips the balance of power towards Iran. But also, there is a question about U.S. engagement when they don't have troops inside the country. We saw that for a period of time when the Americans withdrew um, and drew down their troops from Iraq, that same political engagement just drops, and they don't want that political engagement to drop. So can we have that without a strong troop presence? And finally, American elections. Uh, Iraqis have a very uh, specific point of view of Joe Biden and the memory of his Senate plan, of the Biden plan, and the idea of dividing Iraq. And so many Iraqis are actually not as keen um, to see him necessarily in the White House, even if they have their problems with Trump. So that yeah. um, strategic dialogue will be happening at a time when some Iraqis are like, well, hang on, do we even know that the Trump administration will continue? And if there is a Biden administration, what does that mean for us? Yeah, great. Well, thank you so much for that background. And I think it's a perfect segue to Ambassador Douglas Suleiman, who's the president of uh, AGSIW and a former U.S. ambassador uh, to Iraq, uh, to kind of uh, bring in um, a perspective of U.S. foreign policy and policy making, especially diplomacy. So over to you. Hussein, thank you very much. And I want to thank uh, Mina and Linda for participating with AGSIW this morning in uh, this very interesting uh, discussion. Uh, as I was preparing what I was going to say, my first thought was, why would anybody, why would Mustafa Kadhimi actually want to be the Prime Minister of Iraq? For all the reasons that Mina just laid out. Um, you've got a coronavirus that a lot of which has come in from Iran and probably hasn't even been discovered yet. You have a drop in oil prices, an OPEC plus reduction in Iraqi oil production. You have armed groups inside the government which don't follow the government. You have armed groups like Allah and Daesh, ISIS, which uh, obviously are working against the government or for a local power. Um, you will have nearly a million young Iraqis entering the job market this year with almost no chance of getting um, a job. A continuation of the anger and frustration in the streets, although it's moved from streets to living rooms during coronavirus. And frankly, the biggest problem for Iraq for me is not necessarily a security one, but an economic one. Iraq remains at its heart a socialist, Baathist, centrally controlled economy, a rentier state where the government has significant resources, but is serially unable to effectively distribute them and develop the country. So the challenges confronting uh, Mustafa Qadimi or who, whoever becomes the prime minister are huge. What I'd like to lay out for this group in a little bit of detail is what I see as a likely U.S. government agenda with Iraq in the coming months. Um, and as Mina pointed out, both Secretary of State Pompeo and Iraqi Foreign Minister Mohammed Ali al-Hakim have announced um, a resumption of the U.S.-Iraq strategic dialogue led by Under Secretary of State David Hale, possibly in June, but I don't know whether coronavirus will actually permit that to happen. Um, According to Pompeo, this is going to, among other things, try to resolve the question of what should an American or coalition or NATO force presence in Iraq look like? I'll leave some of this to Linda because she's the expert. Um, but per Hakim, he said, we will be doing this on the basis of the 2008 U.S.-Iraq strategic framework agreement, which doesn't really contain a security element other than to refer to a separately negotiated uh, security arrangement. So. Uh, in this context, I want to lay out some of the things that I think will come up between the United States and Iraq, American request of Iraq in the coming months. Um, first and foremost is going to be uh, protecting American diplomats, American diplomatic facilities, U.S., NATO, and coalition troops on the ground. These are very basic governmental responsibilities which Iraq has been simply unable or unwilling to implement uh, for a number of years. And to the extent that Iraq wants to be considered a serious um, and sovereign nation, it needs to be able to, at a minimum, keep those people who are in the, in the country doing their work, um, either 
at the invitation of the Iraqis on the military side or the diplomatic work safe. Um, a second issue is going to be the discussion of a future role for foreign forces in Iraq, whether they be American, coalition, or NATO. Uh, my personal opinion is that Iraq needs to continue to have coalition counterterrorism training, intelligence assistance, and they really need assistance in professionalizing and institutionalizing the Army, the Navy, the Air Force, the counterterrorism service, those institutions which are directly tied to the elected government in Baghdad and have as their primary responsibility protecting the country and providing security to Iraqis. Um, and right now, uh, they have come a long way since 2014 uh, and the invasion of ISIS, but they're, I'm not certain that they are uh, concrete enough, solid enough uh, to, uh, to move forward without continued assistance. Mm -hmm. Third, uh, the United States is going to ask uh, the new government of Iraq to at least come up with a plan to bring the popular mobilization forces under the control of the government in Baghdad. And this does not mean kicking down doors and, and putting everybody in jail, but it does mean finding ways in which the government can gradually exercise real control over the command uh, of these units. Things like the government itself directly paying soldiers, uh, breaking up the units that came in from the previously uh, constituted units and uh, mixing up the command and control structure of the PMF. Um, this, I think, will be a real key to truly achieving Iraqi sovereignty. It's the other half of keeping the security forces strong, is making sure that right. every organization that has um, the ability to use violence is actually under the control of the elected government. Yeah. Um, fourth, and moving on to the economy, the U.S. is going to uh, want to make sure that Iraq continues to maintain close control over the Iraqi U.S. dollar auction and the dollars don't bleed into Iran. And if they were to reduce the cooperation of the Iraqi Central Bank with the U.S. Treasury, this is the one area where I believe U.S. sanctions uh, could well be applied on Iraq. And these could be very devastating sanctions economically if the United States significantly limits or cuts off Iraq's access to the U.S. banking system. Um, fifth, the U.S. is going to ask Iraq to continue to work to achieve what uh, the administration will call energy independence. What this really means is uh, cutting off Iraq's dependence upon imported gas and electricity from Iran, because Iraq burns more associated natural gas than it imports from, from Iran. Um, Washington, I am certain, however, is also going to ask that this be done in coordination only with American companies. And I think you've got a bit of a contradiction that Washington will have to work through. Are we more concerned in Washington with uh, reducing Iran's influence on Iraq's energy production through the imports of gas and electricity, or are we more interested in getting uh, deals for American companies? This is a, a uh, sort of a conundrum. I think Washington has wanted to have its cake and eat it too, but we may have right. to look at the more important strategic goals as opposed to the goal of U.S. Uh, US companies. Um, associated with this, the U.S. is going to ask the new government to make, uh, to permit targeted investments in certain sectors, probably in oil and gas, where there is real interest from outside participants, um, for the purpose actually of freeing up government invest capital investment revenue from the Ministry of Oil that can be applied into other areas of the country, which are far less likely to get foreign investment. But seven, it's going to need decisive Iraqi government action. Um, the Prime Minister and the new cabinet will have to have the courage, and in some cases, the ability to overrule recalcitrant bureaucracies who have had trouble approving trade deals, investment deals, um, visa regulations, educational exchanges, uh, anything that brought in a Western influence or did not bring personal wealth to uh, bureaucrats who were engaged uh, or imbalance the power structure of the bureaucracy was often thwarted by the bureaucracy. Um, eighth and with Gulf, uh, the United States will continue to ask Iraq to expand its relationship at a minimum with its three neighboring Arab states um, that are uh, still in, able to do that, with Kuwait, with Saudi Arabia, and with Jordan. But th this request is not simply happy talk and meetings going back and forth. It is actual border openings. It is actual facilitation of trade and the movement of people and capital across these borders to help develop the Iraqi economy. 
And then finally, I think in the short term, we will also ask both Baghdad and Erbil to reach agreement on an Iraqi government budget uh, for 2020, which I understand was near complete in 2019, which will uh, set the stage potentially for a longer term uh, oil revenue sharing agreement between Baghdad and Erbil. So this is a very, very broad, daunting agenda. The yeah. security issues that Linda will talk about are, are really difficult. I think for the longer term uh, survival of Iraq, uh, the economic issues are as or more important than the security issues. Uh, so Mustafa Qadimi or whoever is the prime minister will have a lot of demands in front of him. And I haven't even addressed Iranian demands and demands of other countries yeah. in the region. So you can, you can uh, go to that. Yeah, well, we're definitely going to come to uh, Iranian demands and, and even Iraqi demands. Uh, I'm going to raise that with Mina because you've covered the American agenda in the strategic dialogue really well. But I think we'll... We'll, we'll take, we'll try to look at the other side of that. But first, uh, let's bring in Linda, um, who's a uh, extremely distinguished uh, journalist and analyst who has focused a lot of her work on US military special forces, et cetera, and spent a great deal of time uh, with them, including in Iraq. And uh, so Linda, if, if I could ask you to sort of build on, on the last two speakers and, and narrow the aperture a little bit um, and talk about the, the military relationship, the status of forces, the role the US military is playing in Iraq now, how the uh, military may be seeing uh, its development and, and what's your sort of analysis of where that stands and where it's going. Thank you. I'm delighted to be with you this morning, and I appreciate Ambassador Doug's uh, invitation for me to come along. We've been in a couple of uh, recent engagements together, and I I do um, I will focus on this uh, military question, but it, to stitch a couple of threads across the um, Mina and um, Doug's comments. It is a truism, as Mina said, Iraq always seems to be at the brink, but I do think this is really an existential moment for Iraq. And similarly, I think Iraq-US relations are at a critical uh, crossroads. I, I do uh, see uh, most of Academy as someone who's been very skillful. I've gotten to know him a bit, and I think this is uh, it's hard. Uh, I don't want to be a Pollyanna about Iraq ever, uh, but I think he has reached out to all the stakeholders uh, in this very complex region and has a chance. Uh, that mm -hmm. said, I think we're in uh, quite an important moment, which, which I would characterize as a decision for the U.S. really about whether it wants to make Iraq all about Iran or whether it's going to pursue a policy that acknowledges these critical uh, long-term issues that Iraq is facing. And I think uh, in the near term with regard to Iran, uh, whether or not uh, Iraq can move forward, I think depends largely on whether the U.S. and Iran decide they want to de-escalate the path that we have been on inside Iraq. The decision ultimately, of course, to rein in the Iranian-backed militia groups in Iraq has to be an Iraqi decision backed by Iraqi actions. Uh, but I think we're at a moment now where both the US, despite what you said, Hussein, about some figures in the administration think it's time to go for the jugular. Uh, I think that there is a, there are cooler heads that say, okay, we have a lot at stake. Iraq is an important uh, country in the region, and going for broke now could have a lot of blowback and counterproductive effects. Yeah. Uh, and I think the way home from people that take the longer view is Iraqi nationalism and the Iraqis' desire to minimize the unwanted Iranian influence right. uh, is the pivot point, is the leverage point. So yeah. to now focus on the, um, the military issue, uh, I've been going there since 2003 and I watched this uh, actually, I was on the border in Kut in April of 2003, watching hordes of people, vehicles and coming in across the border from Iran and saw a standoff as uh, the Jaish al um, uh was formed and splinter groups attacking U.S. forces in the lead up into the surge period and then in the counter Daesh period, uh, attacks uh, or, or at least 
confrontations with U.S. and coalition troops as this uh, burgeoning array of uh, militia groups uh, was formed. So uh, the U.S., for background, the U.S. and the coalition navigated very carefully throughout the counter Daesh campaign the Iranian presence, the Iranian-backed Iraqi presence. It really came to a head with the January 3 strike, which not only killed uh, Qasem Soleimani, but of course for Iraqis critically, Abu Mahdi al muhandis a top Iraqi official, uh, yes, the head of the Kateb uh, Hezbollah militia, but very critical Rubicon there that the U.S. would take an unannounced unilateral action to kill mm -hmm. a senior Iraqi official. So what is U.S., the U.S. military doing there? Of course, its official mission is and has been uh, uh, to, at the Iraqi government's invitation, to help it counter Daesh or the Islamic State. And that has been the five-year mission of Operation Inherent Resolve, which is the U.S. military name uh, for the operation, that has been overseen by a three-star command uh, called the Combined Joint Task Force, OIR. Uh, and that is currently led by Lieutenant General um, Pat White. It's been led by three-star generals uh, from the beginning uh, with James uh, Terry at the stand-up in 2014. Uh, the, the U.S. has been at an inflection point, leaving aside the Iranian, the standoff, the tit-for-tat, the escalation. It mm -hmm. has been a conversation now uh, since the previous CJTF commander, General Le Camera, about whether they were going to go down in size in the footprint, go down to a two-star command, and eventually off-ramp to a security cooperation mission that would eventually be run, <clears throat> excuse me, out of the U.S. Embassy, which is what was uh, set up in the 2001 period following the U.S. departure in Operation New Dawn, it was going to be simply a U.S. security cooperation mission. And that quickly got downsized into a very minimal uh, presence. Uh, I would have to say one connective piece that remained, and it's a critical one, uh, two special forces teams remained as part of that embassy-based security cooperation, which was the tether to the counterterrorism service. So it very critically did not degrade and fall apart as much of the Iraqi army did uh, when Daesh came and took over a great swath of the country in 2014. And indeed, mm. the counterterrorism service was in the lead of most of the major military operations <clears throat> excuse me, as the Iraqi army found its feet, <clears throat> pardon me, and began to uh, come in uh, and then playing a major role in the liberation of Mosul and the uh, final operations there in uh, 2017 to eradicate the physical caliphate. There is still, of course, a presence of the Islamic State. It's still an open question how much of an insurgency is going to gain traction very complicated, many political drivers of that. Uh, the will of the Iraqi government uh, to stabilize and rebuild and recover and reach out to all of its population is, I would say, the, the critical factor. Uh, but where is the U.S. military and the coalition going from here? Uh, as I said, the, the 5,200 more or less troops uh, that are there have been uh, consolidating onto bases, uh, they are. Uh, they have also been in, um, training trainers. So in the last um, six months, about five thousand tra Iraqi trainers have been uh, trained, and they are taking over much of the training. So there was already a trajectory for Iraq to assume more and more of this mission. The uh, coalition has also been doing operational support, intelligence, air support, and advisory uh, missions on the ground out in the field with troops. Uh, but the trajectory has always been, when is it time to hand off more and more of this? And the idea is to do it in a gradual way. Part of the question here, and as, as Doug already mentioned, what is the portion that the US-led coalition needs to continue to do? How much can be done by the NATO mission Iraq, which is a nascent mission that has been working really at the institutional level and at the MOD, Ministry of Defense level. And then very importantly also to mention the European Union assistance mission. And that has been focused very helpfully 
on the Ministry of Interior and the police forces. Because over this long saga of the U.S. being involved in Iraq, they have always uh, paid less attention to the police forces, which are absolutely critical to uh, securing and the end game of any insurgency is to have viable, competent police forces. I'll, I'll just make one last comment uh, about the uh, um, trajectory of the popular mobilization forces. This is an entity that's enshrined in law. It includes yeah. some groups very closely allied with Iran, but also, as all of you probably know, being the cognoscenti, a great number of these groups were formed at the behest of the Grand Ayatollah Ali al-Sistani, and they right. were people that answered the call to defend the country against ISIS. So it's a delicate issue about how this fourth security service uh, needs to evolve in the future. And some of that manpower definitely needs to go into the uh, Iraqi army, police forces, possibly even the special uh, forces elements. Um, but it, the real concern has been its use as a politicized tool controlled by Iran. And the protests, which N Mina gave such a masterful overview of Iraq's uh, situation. Iraqis do not want this um, cat's paw of Iran uh, to be exercising control over their security and political affairs. But it is not for the U.S. And if the U.S. tries to buy fiat uh, create the future rather than support the Iraqi way ahead, it will be shown the door. Uh, and I think it's very important to underline there are many Iraqis that want the U.S. to set, stay. And it doesn't have to be a status of forces agreement. We have actually managed quite well in the last five years with the exchange of diplomatic notes. As soon as you try to enshrine it under a status of forces agreement, yeah. ask for a voice vote show of hands in the council of representatives and the parliament and that can make it politically very hard for some groups that are more nationalistic to vote for a continuation of this presence so over to you thank you that's great linda thank you so much and uh, i'd like to just pivot slightly back to mina for a second and get your take on the planned strategic dialogue um, that Doug was mentioning that may or may not happen in July or June or this summer, supposedly, um, between Iraq and the United States. I think Doug gave us a really good overview of what the American priorities and goals would be. They're very ambitious, uh, but that's good. I guess it, it's better to have a full plate than nothing. And then Linda was talking about some of the uh, complications that, that arise from some of those issues. So uh, how do you think that that looks from an Iraqi perspective, um, particularly if the new government that seems to be coalescing around Qadami is actually constructed and is the one that goes into that conversation, assuming it can happen, the pandemic notwithstanding? Yeah, I mean, I think they might end up doing what we're doing. So let's see if video yeah, conferencing. Yeah. Uh, right. George used to love doing the video conferencing with Iraqi leaders. He used to do it with Maliki and others. So, so we'll see. Um, look, I think from the Iraqi side, there there would be five main 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 points. Um, and again, we currently don't have a government. They might um, flesh this out differently. But what seems very evident is the first is the issue of troop presence. Mm -hmm. So uh, maintaining that military relationship, especially on the uh, on the um, training and the advising side, and also because the U.S. has spoken about a greater NATO role, that's something Iraq has genuinely um, wanted previously, and we've seen the push from the Trump administration. So that troop presence, whether it's a U.S. troop presence, whether it's a greater NATO troop presence, what that looks like. The second element is tied into that, which is weapons. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, Iraqis want to maintain some, uh, you know, military might that includes uh, American weapons and technology that, of course, the U.S. is often concerned about because of those ties with Iran. And you often know that if something goes uh, to Iraq, it will find its way into at least Iranian knowledge, if not Iranian hands. Um, the third element is is related to the economy, and that's everything from waivers for the Iran sanctions, and we'll see um, where that goes. I think we're about 10 days into the last 30-day uh, waiver that was signed. So maintaining those waivers in terms of um, relations with Iran is one, I have to say that many people inside of Iraq are getting tired of, because frankly, the buying of Iranian gas doesn't really make sense when Iraq 
is um, so rich in petrochemicals and should be uh, developing its own capacity rather than flaring its own gas to use its own gas. So it's something actually that you'll find some of the advocating saying to the Americans, maybe it's it's good to actually stop that um, dependence on um, Iranian gas, but we'll see. So it's economic waivers, but tied into that also is larger economic support. Again, given the financial crisis that is going to hit the world and has already started hitting the world, it's going to be difficult to see that happening, especially when Iraq is uh, rich in resources, but they will seek some sort of support. Um, and then the next one will be um, for Iraq. I believe that the, the the one that they will really try to stress is not to be a launching pad against Iran, to try right. to decouple this idea of, and I think, um, you know, we just heard really eloquently from Linda, this idea of not having your U.S. strategy as being how does this relate to Iran rather than an independent Iraq strategy and what does that look like and not to have a repeat of what happened um, on January 3rd. Right. So uh, I'd like to start to bring in some questions uh, from our audience because they're, they're really interesting. Um, and the, the first one is kind of a, a conceptual question. Um, why, and it's, I suppose it's mainly for uh, Doug and Linda, which is, why should the U.S. continue to invest in Iraq at a time when its own needs are so clearly elsewhere? I'm, I'm not sure that they are so clearly elsewhere because it depends on what you think national priorities are. I mean, if you care about global stability and terrorism, things like that, you might, you might not agree with the premise here. But I think it, it cuts to, uh, it's a good question because it cuts to um, the whole approach to international relations, this, this sort of embodies a, uh, a version of um, uh, almost a, a neo-isolationist or an America first, right, which could be uh, a right-wing Trumpian version um, or a, uh, um, a, a left-wing Sanders version of why are we bothering with the rest of the world when we have our own problems, and, or at least why are we bothering with Iraq? Um, and so the, the question then becomes, how would you answer that? Um, and how do you think the, 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 you know, the government sees it as well as others? Um, either one of you could begin. But I'd like let, your, your views. Yeah, I was saying, let, let me start on this, because um, it's, it's a valid question giving the political debate sure. in the United States about what the role of the United States ought to be overseas. Um, right. I would say the main reason for a continued U.S. investment of any sort in Iraq is essentially the underlying reason that we went into Iraq in 2003 was an attempt to help turn Iraq from a provider of instability in the region to a provider or a source of stability in the region. So um, at, at the very base of our intervention in 2003 and most of what we have done since is to make Iraq a positive regional player that will uh, integrate into relationships in the region, integrate economically more completely, um, and given the great wealth that Iraq has, potentially be a provider of uh, uh, prosperity in the region as well as stability. Um, that said, it's, a, it's not quite a pipe dream, but it is a long-term proposition, but that's what has been driving at least the American bureaucratic desire to keep uh, investing and staying in Iraq. Um, mm -hmm. A little bit more uh, short-term one, which is there is no better place and probably no other place where the United States needs to engage if we wish to push back against Iranian expansionism and Iranian adventurism. Um, Iran, especially under the maximum pressure sanctions, has doubled down on Iraq and in Syria as its focus of at least the foreign policy as run by the Quds Force and the IRGC. Um, and then maybe, maybe a third reason, again, uh, smaller, is there are still a number of American companies which are interested in investment and commercial deals in Iraq, not necessarily yet on the terms that Iraq has been willing to offer, but uh, with some, as I said, more decisive decisions uh, coming from a new Iraqi government. There might be American companies right. who, again, uh, want to make significant commercial investments uh, with the expectation of... Uh, larger profits down the road. So there are three, one conceptual and two somewhat shorter term reasons why we might want to continue to invest uh, spiritually in Iraq. Hmm. Linda, do you have anything to add? 
Uh, yes, thank you. That was an excellent. Um, I'll just add three quick points. I think Please. it's very important that um, uh, the U.S not vacate the region. That's how some people read the national defense strategy and the national security strategy as pivoting away from the Middle East. And I think a, a, uh, a vision that has the Gulf countries stepping up more to support Iraq. And of course, Iraq is playing a critical role uh, to continue to manage the uh, ISIS problem in Syria. And of course, Syria is quite the basket case and not the subject of our talk today. But these are all connected. And as, as Doug mentioned, the uh, key competitor in the region is Iran with its destabilizing policies. The second one is the U.S. needs to maintain uh, an engagement in Iraq, uh, specifically in the region more generally, because Russia and China are heavily investing militarily and economically to gain position and influence in that region. To use the uh, national defense strategies terms, the great power competition uh, with Russian China is actually occurring in places like the Middle East and places like Iraq. And then finally, I think the uh, question was very astute because uh, with the U.S. is all about putting the right amount of resources, presence, yeah. money, and military, not disproportionate. And I would mm -hmm. note that Operation Inherent Resolve has been carried out with a fraction of the cost of the earlier Operation Iraqi Freedom. And we're actually working right now on a five-year assessment of the train and equip a fund to find out what, what works best. And I think there are a lot of people legitimately frustrated that we put a lot of money and materiel behind forces that are not getting adequately professionalized and led. And the Iraqis do have to step up and do their part. So conditionality is should be a part of the mix here. Thank you. Yeah, can I just say, I mean, I, 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 I'm amazed people still talk like this because we've just seen a remarkable demonstration of the central, continued centrality of the Middle East to uh, the U.S. economy uh, when Saudi Arabia, you know, increased its production in an oil war with, with instigated by Russia. And it was a major economic crisis in the United States. And a crucial subtext to the coronavirus collapse was the, was the oil price collapsing. Yeah. You know, the president had to leap into action. Congress had to start threatening all this stuff. I, I, I don't know what could have been a clear refutation of the idea that, that the Middle Eastern doesn't matter for the United States. However, let me throw something uh, to you, Mina. Uh, one of our um, uh, audience asks how we explain the maneuvers of Muqtada Sadr in recent <laughs> weeks. Uh, how do you read his role? It, it's, uh, yeah, good luck with that. Yeah, Do your exactly. best. Do your best. Uh, We've got limited time, so I'm not going yeah, to pontificate too long. All I will say is for Muhtar al-Sadr, it's one about survival and influence. And he often changes his strategy depending on how he can maintain his influence. At the moment, I think he realized that he um, probably overplayed his hand in confronting the, the protests and kind of his, his blue caps attacking the protesters that most the most recent um incident that made people actually step back and say hang on this so-called nationalist man of the people is not necessarily so and so has had to u-turn so most of the continuously changes his uh, colors and alliances but it's about survival and it's about him wanting to maintain control on that key um group of of predominantly young men who support him and, and he was about to lose them okay we have um a question from someone who spent a good deal of time in Baghdad assisting a prime minister designate that could be one of several people uh, look into the formation of a government. And this individual says they found that uh, corruption was at the root of all or most of the ills that Iraq uh, faces. And this would like to know uh, whether uh, Iraqi economic, political and security problems, how, how deeply are they linked? Uh, to corruption uh, and the centrality of tackling corruption. And if, if that is right, uh, how can the U.S. help with, with that um, agenda? Uh, and any of the three of you could start, um, but I think I'm interested in, in all of your views if you have any. Uh, I've got Please. some very strong views on the perception of corruption in Iraq. Um, I mean, first of all, um, a lot of the corruption in Iraq is because of the size of the bureaucracy, the uh, 
for many years desire to hire every Iraqi uh, for a long time man and then now men and women with a university degree give them a government job and give them some responsibility. So now you have where one official should be making a decision, a committee of 10 or 15, all right. of whom have to agree before a project or a decision goes forward. That is where the opportunity for corruption has exploded in the past 15 years with the number of people who actually touch decisions that have economic or political or security um, impact. So uh, I think, I mean, there are essentially two ways to approach corruption and both of which have to move forward. One of which is uh, sort of punishing those who are corrupt. But my concern about Iraq is that so much of the bureaucracy, um, everything from the, the policeman on the, uh, at a checkpoint who takes a uh, thousand dinars to let a car full of kids pass to government ministers who want a part of contract. If there is a, a program to punish people who are corrupt, it could potentially strike or make yeah. the Iraqis across the country at all levels of society nervous that they too will be caught up in it. Um, yeah. What I would rather see done, it's something that the World Bank and USAID and the European Union, various parts, did starting in 2012 and 2013 very seriously, was looking at the World Bank's ease of doing business survey and taking the, Iranian, so the Iraqi economy sector by sector and be, um, drawing up a plan to deregulate each sector. Um, mm -hmm. The example I can think of is something that happened in 2014 before Daesh came across the border from Syria. Um, this was tried in the construction sector and the uh, alteration of five or six uh, government regulations in the construction sector moved Iraq from 184th to 124th in the world in one year um, in the ability to do business in the construction sector, mostly with the government responsibility for paying back contracts. Something as small as this, uh, and particularly if you reduce the number of people who touch any particular decision, will reduce the opportunity for corruption uh, and make it easier for rational commerce and the free market to, to function. So that is a, a very broad outline of what I think probably needs to be done, but it is long term and it is gradual. Great. Uh, Linda, any thoughts on the U.S. role in that regard? Um, well, I think that this is something I mentioned conditionality with regard to military assistance. I would also think enshrining those uh, standards and the World Bank uh, also has accountability and transparency standards. I think these are very important yeah. things. This is the number one issue behind the public protests. Uh, people are uh, Iraqis are fed up with a degree of uh, corruption, individual corruption in high places in government. And I would separate that from the patronage system that uh, Doug uh, mentioned and the way home there is really developing a private sector uh, to right. get off the oil economy. And the U.S. can also help with that in, in other ways. Thank you. Right. And that goes directly to the ease of doing business because you can't create a, uh, a viable private sector if you can't breathe. So, right. Um, Mina, let, let me begin with you, but I'd like to get everybody else's perspective. We've got two questions about the, the PMF groups and the potential that they might continue to target um, U.S. forces in Iraq, and if so, how the U.S. should react, and also um, the potential for a U.S. preemptive attack against them. In other words, what about military action on either side of the U.S., KH, PMF, whatever it may be, League of Revolutionaries, whatever it may be, uh, Nexus? And let's, let's begin with Mina, but bring in all three of you, if possible, on that one. Okay, thank you, Sam. If you don't mind, I'm just going to very quickly touch upon the corruption point. Absolutely. No panel discussion is good enough if there isn't disagreement. And I'm going to disagree okay. with um, Linda and Ambassador Suleiman, despite my huge respect for them. And I disagree only on the point of saying it's a much deeper issue. What you raised absolutely is important, both for better management of the country's finances and rooting out some of the low-level corruption. But at the heart of it, we're talking about the government-level corruption. And that has to be 
you know, everything from chasing bank accounts of officials all over the world. You know, the World Bank has a very strong um, task force in terms of chasing the assets of the, the Qaddafi's families of the world and doing the same actually with, with corrupt Iraqi politicians. It's at the heart of everything mm -hmm. and every ill in Iraq. And and just a second point, we can automate a lot of um, the the government um, necessary procedures, but there's been pushback because there are particular political parties that have benefited from the system. Okay, PMF. The one thing, of course, is that the divisions today between the PMF are bigger than ever before. And so that competition is playing out on the streets um, of Iraq, and they're playing out in terms of their attacks on the U.S. You have different groups that want to prove that they are more effective in attacking the U.S., and you have other groups that are laying low because actually they want to be seen as part of a reformed PMF that is an arm of the Iraqi state security forces. And, and, and basically, if you approach the PMF as, as actually you can approach any sort of uh, militant organization. You peel away the ones that are there just because it earns them a salary or earns them yeah. some sort of status in, in society. You'd probably peel away um, a huge figure of the 300,000 members of the PMF today. But you probably have a core, uh, three, four groups that will continue to escalate as much as they can attacks because that's how they see their uh, raison d'etre, but also their ability to survive. Great. Uh, let me throw that same quest set of issues to um, Linda and Ambassador Silliman. Whichever of you wants to go first is fine. I I would just say uh, I'll I'll repeat what it, what I started with. Uh, it actually needs to be a a U.S. and Iranian agreement that they're going yeah. to be escalate. Um, there has been, in fact, a military approach to this. The escalation of the tit for tat actually began back last July, and including a number of presumed Israeli strikes on weapons depots and bases. Mm -hmm. So there has been an effort to try to cut. Uh, defang some of these groups and, of course, the January 3rd strike. Uh, but that runs in, I think that that path leads to the U.S. being ejected from Iraq because there is really a limit to how much unilateral action uh, the Iraqi body politic is going to uh, accept, even though I believe there is a wish to maintain a U.S., not just, as Mina said, the weapon source of choice, but it's the partner of choice. Uh, more broadly, and to balance that Iranian influence, because Iran is not going anywhere. But I think right. that, that there has actually been uh, an over expectation on the part of policy rather than military officials about the effectiveness of a military approach. Right. Excellent. Uh, uh, I'm I'm one thing, if I could, Hussein. Um, I think that the the rhetoric of the new Iraqi government about the PMF and about those groups which do not follow the orders of the government will be very important. Um, the government needs to articulate what most Iraqis actually already know, that there are parts of the PMF who are productive, organized, and uh, answer to the instructions of the prime minister. There are others that do not. Um, and again, I, I think that probably most Iraqis don't understand this, but the policies of Qatayb Hezbollah, uh, Harakat Hez, uh, Hezbollah Lujaba, and other very pro-Iranian groups have essentially now brought Iraq into direct com uh, competition or direct confrontation with Israel in Syria right. and Western Iraq. This is something that the Iraqi government doesn't want, most Iraqis don't actually want, and this is an extension of Iranian foreign policy being exercised by uh, these groups. Most of the public right. actually knows all of this. The mm -hmm. question is going to be, can he articulate it in a way that helps to separate in the minds of policymakers and average Iraqis that there is, if you will, PMF that is beholden to Baghdad and PMF that is not beholden to Baghdad, and that those groups must be made to, uh, must be brought to heel, must be brought under control. Um, Hydra Labadi tried this a couple of years ago by at least saying, those governments which are in the PMF and follow government organizations are legitimate, and those that are outside, we will have to deal with. That was the first step, but they didn't really take any steps to deal with those who are outside government control. Uh, so, one, there needs to be a, rhetoric, a rhetorical return to that separation, and two, some concrete but probably gradual steps to bring those groups more and more into uh, 
into the circle of Baghdad. Right. So there's a related question from another audience member, which, which goes to how would the new PM be able to overcome the opposition of much of the, or some at least, of the Shia political class to the presence of foreign and specifically U.S. troops in, in, uh, in Iraq, um, if that relationship is going to be maintained? Hmm. Uh, anyone? I, 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 I will jump on this and make, I mean, the... the How do you change people's minds? <laughs> yeah, I mean, the truism in Iraqi politics is that most of the Sunnis and most of the Kurds would like to see the Americans stay. Right, That right. all the Shia would not. Um, right. I disagree with that second statement. The, the Shia body politic is oh, very divided on the question of the presence of foreign forces. Of course. And I think the farther to the south that you get and the more that you feel the day-to-day -day impact of... Uh, ruled by militias instead of by an elected local government, uh, the more you would like to see the, uh, the stranglehold of militias on local governments broken. Right. Uh, that goes back at the national level to uh, disciplining the PMF. Uh, right. And you can see that in the protest movement, clearly. I, I think that Kadhimi, this goes back to what I just said, the government needs to articulate that point and that Iraqi sovereignty uh, comes only when Iraqis support the decisions of their elected governments and there are political yep. parties in the Shia side, and particularly more well-educated urban Shia, uh, want to see a balance and want to see foreign assistance to help Baghdad main control. Um, and when you look at Najaf, Najaf does not want to lose its primacy in uh, Shiism to Qom, even though Qom is larger right. and better funded. There are many in the Shia religious establishment who, who sure. see this as a probably um, necessary but unfortunate way to reduce Iranian influence in religious yeah. and social affairs in Iraq as well. So, Ab absolute direct connection between the two, no question. Uh, either of the other two of you want to weigh in on that? Gordian not? If not, oh, sorry, Amina. I was just going to say, unfortunately, quite a few of the political actors will have to be persuaded by getting ministerial positions, yeah. money. So that corruption that we were talking about will probably be part of, of that second answer. So it, it, the, you'd need a sugar coating on the bitter pill of that. Yeah, sure. That, that's often the case. Um, another of our uh, audience members who spent time as a military commander with Special Operations Task Force in Baghdad focused against uh, ISIS wants to know what can and should be done to prevent the continuing disenfranchisement of Sunnis by the government of Iraq policies and also rogue militia groups continued presence in Sunni areas and their conduct and behavior. Um, he says this is the lasting driver of instability. I think that there's no doubt about that. Um, so what can be done about it? Yeah. So I had mentioned in my remarks, and I, I agree, I think it's very critical that as part of the next uh, government's policy that they maintain a focus on uh, the uh, support to resolve the situation of the many IDPs, over a million that remain the internally displaced right. persons. The, uh, you know, the scenes from Mosul shocked the world, right? They were scenes of like Dresden, absolute um of uh, uh, destruction there particularly in west mosul those are very very important markers along the road to uh recovery and incorporation of an iraq for all iraqis uh i think that there are complex politics underway uh ambar saladin and Ninua mm -hmm. will never all speak with the same voice uh so i think it's very important uh, that the, the, the parliamentary system be, be made to work. And I think Halbusi's done a, a decent job, but I think it's really up to the government to signal to those, uh, its constituents, uh, that these programs occupy the top tier of its program of action. Right, great. Um, either of the other two of you want to uh, wade in? To that, like I would like to. Uh, good. I'd, I'd rather. I'd like to see some more recruiting of uh, Sunnis and minorities, and potentially even Kurds, into the mainline yeah. Iraqi security forces. They would, have been marginalized in the army and most of the services, um, even with, under uh, the tutelage of the United States. Um, I think it's also important to try to find um, 
economic lifelines for Anbar in Nineveh that are not tied and directed entirely by Baghdad, which is why openings right. to Kuwait, Saudi Arabia, and Jordan, and potentially later Turkey, uh, would be uh, very important to give uh, an independent source of income to many of these communities. They would be less dependent upon Baghdad economically. Um, right. and wouldn't need, uh, uh, this, this would make it a more stable. Uh, I mean, Jordan in particular, right? Um, you, yeah. That cross-border trade is essential, right? Um, Mina? To, yeah, I want to second what Linda said about the actual rebuilding of major cities um, with Sunni majority populations, especially when it comes to Mosul. I mean, the destruction, it's been three years now since the defeat of Daesh there, and yet most of those places look the same. Um, and right. I would add, treat all Iraqi citizens as citizens. I mean, genuinely <laughs> how the sectarianism that is how the government and state entities have basically been treating people with treat all Iraqi citizens as citizens and, and you'll get everybody yeah. um, much happier. Yeah, no one should feel like they're living under an occupation, right? Uh, I think some people maybe do, and that's not great. Um, all right, so what about um, U.S. continued U.S. pressure? Another uh, of our audience wants to know about continued U.S. pressure on Iraq to cut ties to the Iranian economy, uh, particularly to stop, and I'm, I'm going to add, particularly the issue of dollars flowing through Iraq to Iran. I mean, it seems to me that's a very um, deep sort, potential source of, of ongoing tension and contention. And how do you deal with that? Uh, I, I think that Iran is essentially exploiting the Iraqi economy. Um, yeah. uh, what is interesting, we, when I was at the embassy, we did a several month study with very bad data because neither Iraq nor Iran produces much data on their bilateral trade, but came to the conclusion that at least 90% of the bilateral trade went in the direction of Tehran. It was Iranian exports and Iraqi paying for Iranian goods including mm. a good bit of dumping of low price agricultural products, right. uh, poor yeah. quality manufactured products onto the Iranian economy to sustain, excuse me, onto the Iraqi economy, Iraqi. to right. sustain the less productive parts of the Iranian economy. Sure. At the same time, political pressure uh, from politicians in the Iraqi government, not necessarily at the ministerial level, to prevent trade with Jordan, prevent significant trade with Kuwait or Saudi Arabia that would right. provide alternatives in trade to Iranian goods. Basically, um, yeah. So I, I, some of this is because of the corruption, like the oil and gas or the, the gas and electricity deals, uh, they are very expensive and a large number of Iraqi politicians, political parties and individuals get a lot of money from those deals. So there is strong political opposition to replacing Iranian gas with captured Iraqi gas because people would lose a lot of income. Um, mm -hmm. And if, uh, I mean, the, the Iran-Iraq border is essentially a one-way membrane. Things flow into Iraq, uh, right. smuggled drugs, smuggled pharmaceuticals. Um, the, Iran, the Iranians put great pressure on the Ministry of Health to buy only Iranian-produced pharmaceutical, pro pharmaceutical projects, products for the healthcare system, um, this will require a gradual pushback from a new government to diversify their economic sources um, and provide for greater uh, sort of imports and exports to other parts of the world. Right. Yeah. Okay. So uh, another question is whether uh, Lebanese Hezbollah has any role to play in Iraq right now? And I, I think it says it's kind of out of left field, but I thought I'd throw it out there. It's, it's an interesting question. It wouldn't have occurred to me to even ask. So, I mean, Mina, is there, I mean they're, they're certainly present, present on the border between Syria and Iraq, but, but I mean, do they have any role inside Iraq itself? Great. It's greater than presence. Um, yeah. In the last two to three years, especially, many of Iraq's Shia leaders would end up going to Beirut for meetings um, yeah. with senior Hezbollah commanders. This goes back to the point I was saying about the competition, about who uh, controls the militants inside of Iraq, and, and Nasrallah definitely wants to become that regional uh, kind of godfather of these different, uh, of these different groups. They do play a role. They play a role also in terms of some of the formations of the more militant uh, PMF groups, but there's no real love lost. It's a competition, but, but they do have a presence and also in terms of the smuggling that goes on, some of the money flows that we see. 
Well, and, and Hussein, there was kind of a, a trinity of uh, Shia officials from outside Iraq um, who were greatly influential in the PMF, Soleimani Mohandas from inside Iraq, but Kathrani, who's actually from Lebanese Hezbollah, he, uh, I guess, narrowly missed being at the airport when Soleimani arrived on right. the 3rd of January. But he is the one who still maintains deep personal connections with a lot of the senior Shia political leadership and the uh, the Shia militia and PMF leaders. There is also extensive Lebanese Hezbollah training, mentoring, tutoring of the uh, militias and of the PMF. Uh, they are far more sophisticated militarily and in terms of intelligence and operations than any of the PMF units. And they have been extensively involved on the ground trying to make the PMF better at collecting intel, better at analyzing intel, better at planning operations and conducting operations. Uh, and Lebanese Hezbollah has been acting almost as if it was a foreign government providing military and intelligence assistance to the people. Yes. More so than, the case even than Iran did, because a lot of the Iranians right. don't speak Arabic, and the Hezbollah right. do speak Arabic, and can right. much more easily with uh, the Iraqis. That's what they do where they're needed. They are the vanguard. Linda, do you have any thoughts on uh, Lebanese Hezbollah's role? No, I think Doug just said it. I mean, they've historically performed that training role, sort of the equivalent of our special forces to those units. Right. Yeah, and I think that's true all over the Middle East, where, where, they're, where there's space for them to operate, that they're the ones who are sent, um, not Iranians. Uh, final question. And this is the last one. Thanks for hanging in there. And thanks to our audience for hanging in there with us. Um, this is a good closing question because it, it circles back to the Gulf countries. Uh, and one of our audience members says, uh, Iraq has been trying in the past year to build a balanced regional policy. Is it possible for Iraq to achieve some success in this regard? I think the answer is yes, but how much? And then the more intriguing part of this question is, do you think that Saudi Arabia and Iran share common interests towards Iraq? I throw that out to any of you. And you can answer any part of that you want. And any closing thoughts you have. So, so I just say on the shared interests of Iran and Saudi Arabia as countries, yes, you'd think both would want a stable yeah. country that could not become a headquarter for ISIS 2.0. But for the regime of um, Iran, frankly, no, they, they don't right. share the viewpoint of what the Saudis would want in Iraq. So, so they are actually at, at loggerheads in the, in the um, ideological, but also what they want to get out of Iraq. I think Iraq can have a balanced relationship. The problem is, whether it's the Gulf countries or whether it's the Iranian side, you have to convince both sides that it's okay to have relations, but you're not beholden. And, and I think for the Gulf, they understand that because most Gulf countries did have regular ties and relations with Iran until quite recently. So they don't yeah. see a problem with that. But you have the problem on the Iranian side that when you start to see an Iraq opening up to Saudi Arabia or to the UAE, to others, the Iranians start having the MPs yes. that are beholden to them, the political parties that are beholden to them, try to scupper any sort of relationship because they see it as an immediate threat because that would allow Iraq to go back to its natural position of being uh, an Arab country that is one of the founders of the Arab League and, and, and it's really its Arab um, identity in addition to, of course, all the monetaries that exist in Iraq um, and, that, and that the Iranians have worked very diligently to, to break up. Yeah, I mean, it also it's you know, a more equidistant Baghdad, equidistant between Riyadh and, and uh, Tehran is a net loss for Iran and not, not for Riyadh. So you can see why uh, one side would prefer it to the other. But uh, I'd like to ask uh, Doug and Linda to jump in on that. How, how much space is there for that? And do you see any, do you see any, any overlap of interest from the regimes? Is it zero sum? Is it really zero sum? Do they see it that way? I mean... Um, I will leave the last word to Doug, but what I'd like to contribute to this is I think we're at a critical moment, as I said, not just with what's the future of U.S. presence, but what's the future of the global coalition uh, uh, to uh, defeat the Islamic State. And I think that uh, the former envoy, Brett McGurk, did quite a lot to try to enlist yeah. Gulf uh, state assistance uh, and, and engagement in Iraq. And I think that if the Saudis don't step up, 
as the U.S. is, is logically downsizing its role and transitioning, that will leave a vacuum uh, that yeah. Uh, will be unhelpful, and I hope that Saudi, uh, the Saudis and the Gulf states do step up because that's what right looks like, uh, and that connectivity and recognizing. Uh, and the Emiratis have made their moves too. I mean, there needs to be some acknowledgement, as my good friend Ryan Crocker always said: Iran isn't leaving the region. Okay, right. we've got to start finding our way forward to what an acceptable balance of power looks like in the region. Right. And Kuwait led the way in, in restoring relations with, at least with the southern part of Iraq, quite early on, um, for fear of any repetition of what happened in, in uh, I know, 20 years ago, 30 years ago. But, Doug. Yeah. Um, what I would say is that we probably have a mix match in priorities between the, the regime in Tehran, which really believes that Iraq is at strategic depth and it must maintain a good hold, and the Gulf governments, possibly with the exception of Kuwait, where Saudi Arabia and the Emirates, who really have the resources to help, have had trouble uh, focusing their attention on what they can or should be doing with Iraq. Uh, what I find encouraging, uh, first of all, if Mustafa al-Khadami does become the prime minister, he has good relationships in the Gulf, uh, probably better than uh, his predecessors. But yeah. when I was last in Riyadh in February, um, when I landed, um, I don't want to say I was inundated, I got a number of requests from organizations and individuals to talk to them about Iraq. And the conversations were essentially all, wow, you know a lot about Iraq, and we really haven't thought about Iraq for a long time, but maybe we should be. So my hope is that even though Mohammed bin Salman is engaged in the huge efforts on Vision 2030, trying to remake Saudi Arabia from inside, that there are now parts of Saudi Arabia that believe it is necessary to find a way to deal with, I think, both Tehran, but particularly with Baghdad. Um, and I did not feel, as I felt earlier in, in Riyadh, that people saw Baghdad as a wholly owned subsidiary of Tehran anymore. Mm -hmm. They seem to be, again, seeing Iraq as a mostly Arab country, a country yep. with which they have had good relations in the past and need to try to do that again in the future. But the question is going to be uh, emphasis, resources, will Saudi Arabia with uh, beset by internal problems, falling revenue, um, oil price wars, and the Vision 2030 and all that goes with that, be able to focus on building a relationship with Iraq that will be productive? And yeah. I hope that that is the case. We will see. Anyway, uh, I'd like to thank all three of you, Linda Robinson, Minal Laraibi, and Ambassador Doug Silliman, very much for joining us today. I'd like to thank all of our uh, viewers for hanging in there with us. Uh, we did go a little bit over as we thought we might, and uh, I apologize to several people who had questions pending that we couldn't get to. But um, anyway, thank you so much. And please join us again next time for another AGSIW webinar. And we look forward to seeing you again there. Thank you very much indeed. Bye. <laughs>